we're now going to investigate the next way for society to make decisions. And that's not majority voting. That is uh, an approach called cost-benefit analysis. And that's the approach that we're going to use in most of this book. It's based on an idea of um, willingness to pay and uh, willingness to accept. So suppose there's, you know, so first let me talk about willingness to pay. The standard term is willingness to pay, but a better term is willingness and ability to pay. So I'm going to use the abbreviation WATP instead of the standard abbreviation WTP because if there's a policy the government is thinking about adopting that would benefit you and somebody asks how much are you how much would you, would you be willing to pay to get the government to adopt this policy that answer is based also on your ability to pay example the government is trying to decide where to locate the next toxic waste dump and it has two locations. One is a location right next to the home where Bill Gates lives, and the other is a location right next to the home where I live. And the government's trying to decide uh, who is, um, is trying to use willingness to pay to see which one of us would, would, would have a higher willingness to pay to avoid living next to a toxic waste dump. So they asked Bill Gates, how much would you be willing to pay to avoid living next to a toxic waste dump? And he gives an answer like, I don't know, five billion dollars. And then they ask me, how much am I willing to pay to avoid living next to a toxic waste dump? And I give an, a an answer, but it's not going to be, you know, in the billions of dollars because I'm not that rich. And so if the government then decides to put the toxic waste dump next to me rather than to Bill Gates, it's clear that the reason is not because I feel any less strongly than Bill Gates about not wanting to live next to a toxic waste dump, but just because I just don't have as much money as Bill Gates has. And so willingness and ability to pay is a better word to describe this idea than simply willingness to pay. And so that's what I'm going to use. The book, of course, uses the standard term, which is willingness to pay. So from page 96 of the book, suppose there's some policy called A, or some new position called A, and the government's thinking about moving to that new position, whether it's cleaning up the environment or making the environment dirtier or imposing a tariff on imported goods or taking away a tariff on imported goods. It's some policy. And we're going to assume that some people benefit from the policy and some people are hurt from the policy because if that's not true then either everybody benefits in which case there's no opposition and obviously the government's going to adopt the policy i mean the government should because there's no opposition to it or everybody's opposed and then the government should fail to adopt the policy because nobody wants it so the interesting case is when some people are helped by the policy and some people are hurt in this case i have i'm going to consider four individuals just like the book individual one two three and four Individuals 1 and 2 are going to be helped by the policy, and 3 and 4 are going to be hurt by the policy. So individual 1 is going to be helped by the policy, and we ask, what is his willingness and ability to pay to move to a policy, to adopt the policy? And suppose that's $10. Now, <clears throat> we're going to have a few chapters studying how do you come up with this $10. Do you just ask people? What if ask people? What if people don't tell the truth? Do you, instead of asking people, try to observe their behavior in the marketplace and infer this ten dollars? So we'll get to that. But for here, let's just suppose we know what the answer is, and it's ten dollars. And then you ask individual two, what is their willingness and ability to pay? Because they also benefit from moving to A, and they say eight dollars. Now you move to individual three, who's one of the people who's hurt if you move to policy A. And you ask individual three, 
how much money would you be willing to accept in comp to fully compensate you if we did decide to move to A? That's the willingness to accept question. So WTA, which I guess I haven't typed out, is willingness to accept. And here we're asking the willingness uh, of the loser to accept compensation if we go ahead and move to A. And suppose that is $6. And then you have another individual who's a loser, individual 4. And you ask him what's his willingness to accept to the book's uh, language to tolerate a move to A. And individual 4 says $5. Or whether he says it or not, let's say we, we presume that we know that the truth is that, it's, that his willingness to accept is $5. If you add 10 plus A, you get 18, and if you add 6 plus 5, you get 11. So the winners gain 18, moving to point A, adopting policy A, and the losers lose 11. Now, this approach, which goes by actually three different names, cost-benefit analysis, it also is called the potential Pareto criterion, and is called the Caldor Hicks criterion after the two British economists who came up with it. Um, Hicks won the Nobel Prize as y your textbook authors are, are British and they point out in, a, in an endnote to the chapter that, um, that formally we would say Lord Caldor and, and Sir Hicks, Sir John Hicks. Um, so these are really famous economists. And, and what this approach, which goes by these three names, what this approach says is that in this situation, when the winners gain 18 and the losers lose 11, that the conclusion you should draw is that society ought to move to A. Because the winners gain more than the losers lose. Now, the, the older criterion, the, the Pareto criterion, which is what we were talking about with tariffs, would say this. You should move to A, tax the winners, say, I don't know, $12, somewhere between 11 and 18, so let's say, let's make it $12, and give the $12 to the losers. Sorry, let me write it again. This ought to make, it ought to be a win-win, ought to make everybody better off. Because the winners now end up, so on net, the winners end up with 18 minus the 12, which is positive 6. And the losers end up with minus 11 plus 12, so that's positive 1. So it's a win-win. The winners are winning more than the losers. If you picked a different, if, if you picked a different number than twelve, uh, if you picked something closer to eighteen, that you could change that. But in any case, uh, both of them are winning, and so it's a win-win. That's a Pareto move. Remember, Pareto means everybody's better off, and it would show that the situation before you move to A is inefficient, and a Pareto improvement is. Moving to A, taxing the winners $12, giving the $12 to the losers, and that would make everybody better off. Potential Pareto is totally different. Potential Pareto says, even if you don't tax the winners and give the money to the losers, society should still move to A. This is vastly more controversial. We're talking here about an ethical question. And so I don't think it's quite correct to say that one side is right and the other side is wrong. But it's actually pretty hard to defend a notion that 
just because the winners could compensate the losers and have everybody better off, society should move to A even if the winners actually don't compensate the losers. And so the losers just lose. Why should the losers support a policy that makes them lose just because there's some other policy, mainly moving to A, taxing the winners $12 and giving the $12 to the losers, that would make the losers win? In fact, it actually sounds kind of bizarre that that society would go ahead and say, society would go ahead and adopt the policy move to A because there's a different policy, move to A, tax the winners $12, and give the $12 to the losers, that makes everybody better off. In other words, because this different policy on the right exists, you're going to say that this policy on the left ought to be adopted. This is really pretty strange. Um, and, and indeed, it was controversial ever since the beginning. I mean, Cal and I think I said this in a previous video too. Uh, it, it only took a few years after Calder and Hicks were writing in 1939 and 1940 for, for other economists to say this is just nuts. Uh, there, there's no reason why society should adopt the policies that says move to A because there's some other policy over here which makes sense, which is win-win. Uh, a, a couple of um, a couple of other notes here. So certainly this seems to be unfair to the losers. Uh, what I haven't talked about yet is that this criterion disadvantages the poor, but go ba going back to my example with Bill Gates and myself and who's going to get cited next to the toxic waste dump. I mean, the people who are going to have the really high willingness and ability to pay are going to be rich people. And so they're going to have an advantage in cost-benefit analysis, which is also called Calder Hicks and also called potential Pareto. Uh, by the way, the potential Pareto says it's, you know, society should move to A is a potential Pareto change because there's this possibility of a Pareto change, even though you're not really going to do that. In any case, that's where the name comes from. So poor people are at a disadvantage. That's another a shortcoming, at least in, in my mind and in the mind of lots of economists, of, of this approach. Now, there is a it's not to say that willingness and ability to pay and willingness to accept are totally useful. There's a fix. You could use this not to institute the, the Calder Hicks cost benefit analysis, potential Pareto social decision making criterion, but instead use it just to try to locate potent, uh, actual Pareto moves. In other words, you could, the economists could gather this information from individuals. One, two, three, four, and then the economist could su could suggest, how about doing this? How about moving to A, taxing the winners twelve dollars, and giving the twelve dollars to the losers, and then go back to individuals one, two, three, four, and say, is everybody okay with that? You know, you want to check yourself because in the real world you don't know if these numbers are accurate. Um, so you want to check yourself to see if that's a Pareto move. And of course, if you designed a Pareto move, everybody's going to want to go for it. So that's great. Okay, so uh, we are. I I'm going to stop this video now. Uh, we'll do a second video uh, concerning the last part of this s slide next.